Uh, good morning to everybody that's here. I appreciate you all for coming. Um, my name is Bree Alsbury. I'm one of the community learning specialists at Do Space. If you're not familiar with Do Space, um, we are a nonprofit technology library um, in the Omaha metro area. We're kind of a one of a kind. Um, we were built to provide access uh, to uh, the community for technology. Uh, obviously, we're finding challenges in that right now as our building is closed, but we're um, hosting webinars, uh, reaching out to the community. Um, so today we have uh, Pat Wagner here with us and she will be speaking on uh, online success uh, in, in the classroom. So I'm just gonna let you take it away. Great, Bree, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today, folks. Uh, for those of you who haven't worked with me, I've been a trainer and consultant for libraries and allied institutions since 1978. And I've looked it up and I've been coming in doing programs in the Nebraska, uh, Iowa area, particularly Omaha, since 1996 so pretty familiar with the area and i put up this sort of fun little biography not to impress anybody but to confess that even though i through happenstance including dating a man who became my husband who had been a software programmer since 1963 um, I didn't like online training at first. I loved being a college instructor. I loved all of the workplace training I did face to face. I have a degree in theater. It was great fun. But when I started teaching online over 20 years ago, I didn't like it. Yes, I hated it. And the reason I did it is my customers liked it and they were pleased with the results. But there was a real disconnect for me for a long time. Um, I was a radio talk show host for a while and I had kind of a love-hate thing. And then finally, my clients said, we, we need webinars, we need online training. So I did my first webinar and it was, oh, okay, I did it. And then I fell into a group of people at the University of North Texas LEAD program, which was library education at your desktop. And I loved it. I just loved working with them. And now since 2012, we've been doing lots and lots of webcasts and online programs from our place here in Denver. And I have to say that I like it now for two reasons. First of all, I just got used to it. I used to, I got used to all the weird stuff about it. And the second thing, yes, the technology improved. In terms of working out of the house, we've been in business since 1975, and we bought our first house, which is where I am right now, a little bungalow right in the center of Denver. And we realized after we bought our house that each of the cats didn't need their own bedroom. <laughs> so we moved the office into our house. So I've been working out of the house since 1986. My record in the same set of pajamas is five days. And my record for not leaving the house is 11 days, partly because I was on the road so much. So when I was home, I really nested. In addition, because I was on the road so much, I spent a lot of time in motel rooms in the middle of nowhere. And this is in the beginning when nobody had Wi-Fi, nobody had speed, and I travel with physical modems, and I'd have to go to the switchboard of the motel and convince them not to drop the line in my room, even though they saw it blinking for an hour and a half so I could get work done. And then I would have to illegally take apart the phones in the motel room or the hotel room to accommodate the physical modem, which nobody had ever seen before. So I kind of know where you're coming from. I, you know, this is not new to me and I'm speaking from experience, not some ivory tower. There's assumptions I'm gonna make about the audience today. First of all, most of you are, let's say, newish to online learning. And even for those of you who are experienced as trainers and educators, maybe you're looking for a couple of insights or to validate what you already know, that this is not a class that you're taking just for entertainment purposes, that the classes that you're online for are ones that are credit classes um, because you're at the, the college level, or they're required by your work or school because these are the substitutes for being in a K through 12 classroom. I'm going to also guess that maybe you and nobody in your home right now is a tech expert. And I'm also gonna imagine that you didn't marry for money because I noticed that a lot of the suggestions that people make about how to improve what happens at the home sort of implies you have a lot of money to spend on a lot of stuff. And I'm assuming that's not the case today. 
So there's three outcomes today. And every time I do a program, I try to get the outcomes. And here's a little tip. When you're reading through the materials for someone who's giving you a class, look for what their goals are. The better you can meet their goals are, just as in a face-to-face -face class, the more likely you're going to have a good experience. And if it's a graded class, you're going to get a better grade. So for me, I hope that you, first of all, are going to feel more confident and competent today. And let me say for the record that you can probably make a lot of mistakes and no puppies will die. So we're cool. The second thing is it is going to improve what happens with your learning at home environment, how you set up, what it is you're going to do, and that you realize you have to do a little bit of work to make it work well. And there's a gold standard in adult education that when I learned this, it became kind of my shining star that I follow, that there are two things that I want people to get out of a class. First of all, better retention of the materials. Now, some of you are only going to be memorizing sets of statistics and data so that you can, excuse my French, regurgitate it for a test. And that's okay. But for me, most of the work I've done has been with adult learners who actually have to remember the stuff well enough Enough that they can apply the material in their workplace as well. So the retention and application, particularly over time, is what we're looking for as educators when we're helping people face-to-face -face or online. Four agenda, you know, we have an agenda with four kind of chapters and getting it, even if the instructor you have doesn't structure the material for you, you have to make sense of it uh, more so than if you're in a classroom taking notes or de real, uh, dealing face to face with the instructor. So I encourage you to when you get the material from whoever's going to be teaching you this class or course or whatever, structure it so it makes sense to you. So here's the four buckets for me. It's going to be some of the key ideas that I want you to remember. And notice I put them up front so that I don't, as they say in journalism, bury the lead. You get the most important stuff up front. Caveats, the thou shalt nots and sort of stumbling blocks I've noticed over the years. How to prepare your own, your home classroom, meaning the actual physical space and some of the better practices to pay attention to with online learning as well. First of all, the key idea. Um, and if you're like me, most of the time that I've worked at home, I've had helpers, you know, we've been cat staff, as they say, for a number of years. So <laughs> I was very happy to find this lovely picture here. So first of all, this whole idea of what's new and what's old. New school, the digital skills that you need to be online really aren't the same necessarily, uh, necessarily of what it means to sit in a classroom with other people. But these skill sets overlap. So we're going to look at a minute is what is the same about sitting in a classroom versus sitting at a computer terminal home and a couple things that are different. First of all, what's the same? Well, what's the same is all the things that you have to pay attention to as a learner. You have to be able to set your own goals of while, while you're taking the class. I taught um, for seven, I've, I've taught at the college level at um, five different institutions, but I taught for seven years a um, sophomore class in education and adult education, plus a class in conflict management uh, at a very fine state college we have here in Denver that's now a university. And, and the first week or two of the class, since most of my students would be non-traditional learners, over 25, had a job, had a family to take care of, I would invite them in to tell me what your goals were. Are you trying to get a good grade because you have to keep up your GPA? Is it just something that your employer says you have to earn a bunch of CEs? Um, are you taking it because you want to advance your career and you're looking to build your resume? Uh, um, is it something required by other people, okay? Are you just bored? <laughs> Whatever it is, I needed to know what the goals were. You set your own priorities about what's important. So all the things on this slide, things like focus, um, testing things for yourself, trying again, uh, willing to keep going on things, setting timelines and deadlines, the whole issue of time management in a classroom or over a semester is the, absolutely the same. In fact, it's harder to manage your time when you're um, at home 
taking classes, particularly if you're taking recorded classes, and I'm not going to count YouTube, I'm sorry, but you're taking recorded classes, like if you're taking this program and viewing this webinar as a recording, it's harder to manage your time getting through the material when you're on your own in your home or workplace than it is when you have to physically go to a class because going to the class creates the structure. And during the time, particularly when I was working with college students, um, time management became an issue because like most human beings, they would wait to the last minute. Now, just because anecdotally, the literature says that people accomplish 80% of the work on a project in the last 20% doesn't mean that that's like what you're supposed to do. You need to keep up over time. But it's the same thing. And then again, the gold standard that what we're trying to do is retain information and apply the information. So that's the same. Another thing, and this just drives me crazy, I will watch people in a classroom. I will go, for example, to a library or a university where they have a tech classroom and they have computers at every seat and people are there um, listening to my lecture or what I'm doing. They're watching the screen and they're stumbling. And it, it took me a while to figure out what was going on. I'd say, what's wrong? Oh, well, I don't know how to shrink the, the, the screen so I can take notes on my keyboard while I'm watching what's going on. And I said, what are you doing? You should have either a device or paper or pencil that you can be taking notes on the screen. And for some reason, they decide they're breaking some obscure law of the time-space continuum that they're not supposed to take notes with pen and paper. You know, we've got that new research that's come up the last four or five years that and, and everything applies to everyone differently. You know, when you're talking about the social sciences, it's not like counting boulders in a field. I mean, we're dealing with human beings who are very individual. However, it seems that in a lot of cases they're finding, average human beings seem to have a better chance of retaining information if they're actually using the physical writing rather than just typing into a keyboard. And that is across the board in terms of age, both old and new. And I'm old. I'm, uh, when I say old, I'm old, OK? <laughs> um, but don't feel like you can't take notes on paper. And you know, for me, I have terrible handwriting. But still, when I'm listening to something that's important to me, I would rather have my hand working to take notes, even if it's just bullet notes, than typing into a screen. On other hands, when I'm having a conversation with a client, I'll be there typing on the screen. But if it's a struggle, do something different. If it's a struggle between using old school and new school stuff, try something different that suits you. Don't think that you have to do it just the way you're told to do it, as if there's only one way for people to learn. Now, what's different? There's a wonderful phrase called tacit knowledge. Tacit knowledge are things we know in face-to-face -face interactions with other people for which there are no words yet. It's that sense you get. And people talk about it if you're in a master class. Um, I uh, was taught piano as a child, terrible piano teacher. But I love watching expert people play piano, right, on, on movies and so on. And when you watch the expert classes that are going on in things like piano or any kind of musical instrument or dance, for example, or sports films, whatever, and you talk about that relationship between the teacher and the student, a lot of times the student will say, there are things we learn that I can't put my finger on what I learn just being in a classroom with someone who's teaching me something. I, I can't really describe what it is. And yes, we do videos a lot, but I don't believe videos are the same as being in the classroom. So there's things you learn when you're in the room with other people. I was just talking to my husband about this yesterday because there's been a, a um, a call out to get people who know the old COBOL, C-O-B-O-L, COBOL programming language, because what's happening is that all of these states are being flooded with unemployment claims and requests for loans and money and all these things. And they're still using pretty antiquated equipment that are workhorses, and they've been running for decades. But 
they aren't used to the volume of work they're getting. So they're asking for COBOL programmers. And if you talk to a programmer and mention COBOL, the average programmer is either going to look puzzled or laugh at you because this is like somebody asking for a Model T Ford. But my husband said that one of the problems with working at a distance, and he was a programmer and system analyst for 25 years, and he worked at a distance sometimes, he said, but there's something about being in a room with other programmers, and you're working on some ginormous project, and there's maybe 15 people in the room scattered around at different terminals working, and then someone looks at their terminal and goes, oh, adult word. <laughs> And everyone's head comes up. It's like meerkats in a National Geographic movie and go, what, what? And they come and they crowd around the room. And he said, look, look at this and look at that. And they talk and they have one of those wonderful conversations that we haven't figured out quite how to have uh, at a distance, even with videos of everybody showing. And he said, that's what you miss when you work online. So there is a difference. And what we have to do is make it up, not just looking at a computer screen, but in other ways as well. So there is a difference. And that's what we're trying to do with the best of our ability is to bridge that gap between um, the tacit knowledge, the things we learn from being in a classroom, not just with the teacher, but with other students as well, and what happens online. Another thing that's different is the overhead, and this is when we come into managing tech. Uh, our family is in the midst of dealing with um, estate issues, having to do with a wonderful relative. Don't be sad, she died at 94 a few months ago. Everything's fine. And we were working, we are working with one of the top law for, firms in the region. But they have 300 lawyers. I think it's the second largest law firm in the state of Colorado great reputation, whatever. Suddenly, they're under quarantine and they have to move to their homes. Well, my husband and I were puzzled because we kept sending information off to the lawyer about stuff that we needed to do and asking questions. He didn't respond. I changed emails at my end. And it turned out that at least three times, the tech system at this huge law firm was messing up over and over again with client emails. And every time we sent something, it would send it into the spam box. And this was a lawyer who was used to having secretaries and so on. So he wasn't fixed, you know, looking at his spam folder. And so for a month, we've been struggling. And we're all smart people. And he's got money. <laughs> so we know over decades of dealing with people that you can't count on anyone being so smart and competent and experienced that something's not going to go wrong. So we spend a lot of our time doing backups of different kinds of material, testing the software and the hardware and the peripherals over and over again, knowing there's going to be meltdowns and mistakes. And we can't control what goes on with the internet. We can't control what goes on in the cloud and the satellites and so on. On. So one of the things that can be a surprise for people, even if you've used online resources for, let's say, entertainment or something more casual, it will take you more time to manage technology than it will if you were taking face-to-face -face classes. So that's something that's important to realize when you're trying to figure out how much time you have to take a class. Another thing has to do with the writing. And um, uh, one of the parts of the tacit knowledge is you get is what we call the nonverbal responses. You know, the look on someone's face, the tone of their voice, all that good stuff. And you have to communicate that to the instructor into writing and writing and writing. And when I was first a college instructor, and I, I learned better over time, and I, by the way, like to write. It's no special virtue of me. I think it's in my genes. I just love to write. So it was never an issue for me me. But when I was teaching college for the first time, I had people in my classes who didn't come from college families. So they didn't have anyone in the family they could talk to or friends who had been to college beforehand. And they were, and this we're talking 25 years ago, were horrified at the amount of writing they had to do as compared with high school. They were like, oh my goodness. Well, I get the same thing when I've been introducing people to online education. We did a project with the University of North Texas and the Medical Library Association. And just let me, you know, that librarians who are medical librarians are smart cookies. They are, they're wicked smart. They often have multiple degrees. 
they're specialists, you know, they work in hospitals and such. And we were introducing them to these online courses that would run four or six weeks on the platforms at the University of North uh, Texas. And it was kind of involved. And they were, even then, shocked at how much writing needed to be done because they didn't realize when we started that the tone of their writing and how they responded was just like being in that face-to-face -face classroom, raising their hand, commenting in discussions, all that stuff that if you're an instructor, you pay attention to. And to be able to listen to what other people say, the insights in a well-run classroom are about what people bring to the classroom as well. So the kind of writing that you need to do online, it's not the same as social media. We're not talking about 140 or 280 characters. And you have to be careful about the kind of writing you do. Now, finally, in terms of key ideas, I tell people that even though you might be in um, a situation where nobody in your household um, understands what you're going through with these home classes, what we want you to do is to reach out to people um, to be able to engage the people in your home, if you can, and people that you know, even casually online, to be able to, as I say, exploit them. You know, I remember growing up in Chicago, and I, my sister is almost eight years older than I am. And so when I was still in grade school, my sister was in pre-med, studying to be a medical illustrator. And it was my job at the age of 12 years old to do the flashcards for her when she had to memorize hundreds of medical terms to pass her classes. And so part of my job, and she was my bullying older, older sister, was to hold up the flashcards and then tell her what it said on the other side of the flashcard. And actually, I kind of, I, after a while, I found it kind of fun. So this idea that we engage the whole family is very important. If you don't have a lot of fancy equipment to do physical backups, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, physical backups, then email what you're working on to other people who have other computers. We're going to talk about the cloud in a minute. So that when I'm on the road in a motel and I'm working on something really important, yes, I have versions that are, quote, in the cloud. You can't see I'm doing air quotes right now. But I'll also email documents to my husband. So he has them on his computer, um, on his account. And more than once, I've needed something that I accidentally deleted off of my machine. And I emailed, quote, uh, called my husband, and he was able to email it back to me. To be able to share tech supplies, supplies like suddenly you find out that you need to fax something to someone, and you don't have a fax machine, but somebody in your neighborhood might. And being able to reach out like that can be very important. And finally, not to be afraid to ask for help and advice from people in your immediate community. I call it the find the crazy neighbor. So when I was putting together this class, and again, I live in a very nice older urban neighborhood in Denver called West Washington Park. Um, and we're in a 1903 bungalow. And the housing stock in the neighborhood goes back to about everything from old Victorians from like 1885 to brand new buildings. And we have a real mixed neighborhood. We have people who are on, on welfare and Section 8 housing. We have older couples, newer couples. It's kind of a mixed neighborhood. But just within walking distance, and I made a list, we've lived in this house for many years, of the kinds of people who are my neighbors. I have a neighbor who was a uh, television producer and editor for 25 years. He knows everything about how you record things and take, take example of that. We have neighbors where um, both of the spouses worked as concierges as two of the fanciest hotels in, in Denver. So they all, they know all about what you deal with in a hotel and booking rooms and organizing conferences and all this kind of thing. Um, have a neighbor who's, quote, a day trader who knows all about the stock market. We have a neighbor a block away who works in our neighborhood, but she has a ranch 25 miles away, a horse ranch. 
And we had another neighbor who had a house across the street from us, and he was a farmer. So he lived in town, but he knew everything about farming. So you can't take for, um, for granted that someone in your neighborhood, literally, someone close to you, might have information that you would find useful. My favorite example, a friend of mine who um, was very proud because his daughter got into medical school without a scholarship, the family didn't have the money, and he was totally lost dealing with all the intricacies of trying to get loans and grants. So he called me up because we ran a research service at the time, and I said, ask your neighbors. And he said, I don't think they know anything about this. And I said, just ask, just ask for help. And don't be a lone eagle. I know you're brilliant, but don't be a lone eagle. So he told me later he had this ditzy, and that's the word he used, ditzy, next door neighbor, and she was just an airhead, he said. So he went up to her and he said, I don't know if you can help me or not, but my daughter, Alice, got into medical school. We're so excited. We don't have any money for it. I don't know how to deal with um, the financial assistance part. And he said she sort of transformed before his eyes. And she said, well, before I became a stay-at-home mom, I ran the financial offices of big university for 15 years. Of course I'll help you. And he said to her, I didn't know you knew how to do that. And she said, you never asked. So you know what, we make assumptions about people. And in this day and age, working through the quarantine right now, being able to deal with people, that's part of what's going to support you in your success. Now, the writing thing, it's a big deal. And this is, I would say, most people on the planet believe this is the best free online source to learn how to improve your um, writing. It's from Purdue University in Indiana, and it's called OWL, the Online Writing Lab, and it is totally awesome. And I bet you if you're watching this with family or if you're someone who's in middle school or even elementary school, you know, early grade school, certainly for people in high school and college and adults, this is the place to up your game in terms of writing to make you feel more confident and competent and present yourself better online. The more, the better your writing is, the more comfortable you're going to be, the more articulate you're going to be. And yes, it can affect how people grade and look at what you're doing. So what are some of the caveats, the bewares, like, you know, what should you be worried about? Well, first of all, as I mentioned before, procrastination, that if you're starting a course or starting a class, I'm going to assume that maybe you have to check in once a week for four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks. For those of you in K through 12, you might have a semester's worth of work that is laid out. And if you're lucky, the instructor will give you the whole look at what you're doing so you can kind of plan ahead. Don't procrastinate, even if you think you have all the time in the world. You get ahead at least a week from the start and then you keep up. Um, I, it's kind of like reading assignments that when you're given a book list at the beginning of a semester and they say read these books and people who don't know what they're doing think they have the whole semester and then they start two weeks at the end of the semester to read like 10 books and they said well I'll intelligently scan it but the trouble is that really is going to affect learning and let's just be honest you're great as well so don't procrastinate beware it's 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 tempting but ain't going to work, ain't going to work. And yes, all technology sucks. And this is from a woman who has had a computer or a terminal on her desk since 1978. And my husband has always made sure that we have top grade laptops and stuff. We use it a lot in our business and training and research and so on. Nonetheless, all technology sucks for reasons that are beyond human knowledge. And that includes every single established learning platform out there used by colleges and universities and high schools. I have probably reviewed 35 of them over the last 10 years. And just in the last three months working with different clients, I've used six of them. And they're all awful. I'm sorry, Zoom. Um, nothing much has improved except stability. And what these idiots do, I'm going to vent for a minute, is they come up with a simple platform that works pretty well. And then they add bells and whistles. Bells and whistles make it more complicated. And the more complicated it is, the more likely it is to fail. So what we've learned is that you need time to be able to fix things that are broken. And it's never 
never your fault if technology breaks unless you on purpose take the computer and dump it in the bathtub full of water. That if you haven't dumped it in the bathtub full of water, it's not your fault, okay? So no guilt, no guilt, okay. Um, another thing we have to be aware of, and this is something that is more common in the 20th century than before, is multitasking. Uh, you have so many interruptions at home, you know, people delivering packages. Um, if you are pet staff, meaning that you're the people who are waiting on your cats and dogs and hamsters and so on. Yes, it's a problem. And people have been running very funny stories about their animals, you know, walking over their keyboards and deleting documents. Ha ha ha. Um, but switching between tasks, and they've done studies now, it takes longer than you think. It actually wastes time and you make mistakes. Uh, as an experienced college instructor, I was surprised how quickly I could learn reading someone's document if they were had done it at the last minute, if they had edited it well. And when we talked to them, they'd say, oh yeah, I have a crying baby at home. It's really hard. So you don't realize how many mistakes you're gonna make and how many things you're gonna leave uncompleted. And I have, done this my, I have done this myself, where I've been working on a project and my brain thinks I completed the sentence or the paragraph or the slide or the artwork and I go back to work. And it's not till I do my final check that I realize that there are holes in what I've done. There also is the belief that multitasking, regardless of your age, is actually more stressful, right? We're kind of riding that adrenaline high of bouncing between things and actually you're going to tire out more easily if you do it. Um, it can feel like you're accomplishing more because look at me juggling all these things, but the truth is it can create busy work because then it's like, oh, bright shiny thing and you start getting distracted more. So you have to be able to structure your time in such a way, working with the people who you live with and your pets, <laughs> you know, they have to understand that, no, you're not going to give you, give them your 100% undivided attention 24-7 now that you're home, um, that you have to be able to create spaces where you can focus. Even if it's not your style to focus, it's a skill to learn in the 21st century. Also, the expediency thing, and that kind of goes along with multitasking. Too often, and I have seen this up to this point in time, when I've talked to organizations that have gone online, one of the things people talk about, well, it's easier, it's faster, it's easier for people to do, it's faster for people to do. And they will tell you that studying online and learning online, it's cheap and it's quick. Well, it can be less expensive in terms of how many people do you need to have in a classroom setting to teach a class or to maintain the overhead of a physical space. Um, same thing for cheaping, but it's a myth because simply being efficient at something and doing it quick and cheap doesn't mean that it's effective for everybody. And technology creates its own set of problems, as we know. We have, for example, across the country, a whole patchwork of uh, inequities in terms of people having access to digital resources, the digital divide. It's like a series of canyons and so on. And even in places where you've got really good well, Wi-Fi and a really good digital virtual infrastructure. It's really being tested these days, as we all know. So be careful of falling into the trap of saying to yourself, I'm just going to get this done quick, quick, quick. It doesn't work that way. It's kind of like, again, going to college in terms of how many classes you take and how many hours you're sitting in a classroom versus how much time your homework is going to take and your studying and your research and so on. And when I was a college instructor, there were people who felt, well, I'm in Pat's class for three hours, so I only have to study for three hours outside of class or one hour. No, it was more like 10 or 12 hours. Um, and we, we sort of figured this out over the years, how long it takes. Well, guess what? Same thing is true today, that beware the idea that somehow this is going to make it quicker for you. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you about that. So what about this thing about the home classroom, where we're going to talk about how you set up the physical space that you work in um, and what you might need and what you can do, okay? So um, one thing, and this is me being self-indulgent, 
I think that the more you know about a subject, um, the more accomplished you can be. And being in a classroom, the smarts about being in it is not just about the tools you use, but understanding kind of the methodology of education. When I teach things having to do with communication and learning, I always start off by saying there are over 50 major conflicting theories on how people learn. And as an instructor, I use four or five of them. And if you were taking this class from a different person, you'd learn four or five of them. Don't let people tell you that there's only one way or a best way. That's why I won't talk about best practices. I talk about better ones that I think work most of the time with most people in most situations. So if you go to instructionaldesign.org slash theories slash, you will find a very simple list of 50 theories something to browse and learn. It's the same way that I think people who drive cars don't necessarily have to be auto mechanics, but the more you know about how your car works, the better experience you're gonna have driving your car. The more you know about cooking, the better experience you will have making tasty, healthy meals for your family and friends. So anyway, this is me indulging you that I want you to be smart about learning because it's going to be harder to learn online than it is. Um, with a person in a classroom. When people come to me and they're taking classes, one of the things I tell them is that this is your new job. And maybe when you've been at home doing stuff, your, your home life has been filled with chores and upkeep, uh, playing with your, your family members, including your four-legged and uh, feathered family members and talking to friends and uh, enjoying all of the connections and games and things you can get online. Well, even if you, quote, don't have a, quote, job right now, you do have a new job. If you have a job and you're working from home on that job, guess what? Taking online classes is like having another part-time job. And you can't do everything you were doing before and make time to do it well. So I tell people that as you adjust to this new way of living, and we don't know, this is the middle of April, we don't know how long this is gonna last or what changes it's gonna make in the future. There may be some things that you're used to doing today that you're gonna to have to give up doing. And you're gonna to have to change your priorities. So that's something that when I interview students when I was doing the face-to-face -face class, I would discuss. And also when I was running these big um, classes, courses for the Medical Library Association and other institutions where people would say, I'm having trouble keeping up with the coursework. And then I find out that they haven't been able to give up anything in their life. I don't want you to give up the healthy stuff like sleep <laughs> and exercise, but maybe you're not gonna go to the, to the health club four times a week or your equivalent on that. So what helps with human beings is to establish sort of a home base. It may simply be a card table in the corner of a room. It may be the edge of the dining room table. When I was in college and my sister was in college and my mother was in college, we were all in college in overlapping times. And the joke my dad would make is that we no longer had a dining room. It was a classroom because we basically gave up the dining room table because that was home base. That you might need storage and some office supplies. And I think it's interesting that at least here in Colorado, um, places like Office Max and Office Depot that sell office supplies are considered essential businesses because people get supplies there to help keep their, their businesses and their jobs going. Well, the same is true with the classroom. You also have to have the talk with the cohabitants about the fact that this is going to take you two or three hours a day, maybe more, and that you need off time where you're not bothered where we're recording this in Holy Week right now. I happen to be Jewish. And if anyone's watching this live, uh, whatever your belief system is, whether you're just enjoying Easter eggs and Easter eggs are not part of your spiritual service, that's just fine. But um, a friend of mine said that when she was a writer in New Mexico, uh, her neighbors loved to drop in on her when she was working on tight deadlines. So she put a sign up on the bar across her driveway that said, in effect, unless you spot Jesus on the old Taos road, keep walking. 
<laughs> so you have to sort of decide some protocols for the family of I'm working on something and please don't interrupt me. And you're not being um, elitist about it. It's just that you know if you aren't able to focus, you probably won't do as good a job. And it'll take a little bit of negotiation and some people won't believe you. Do the best you time. It really is fun and it works for a lot of people to have that busy sign up behind the, on the closed door, on the back of the chair, and to keep to the regular schedule so that people know when they have to and when they don't have to tiptoe around you. And physical calendars, meaning not just something online, but something on the refrigerator, you know, or on a back door. We, we have a, uh, setups in a couple of places in our house to put up physical signs as we need to. Physical signs of different kinds, they kind of work pretty good. Um, and if it's something that you think is too old school, try it and see if it doesn't communicate well. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but it's something else to try. Um, if you don't have a copier or a fax machine, this is a good time to maybe check in with people around you to see if somebody can, you know, if you can borrow something from someone that they don't use very often, because sometimes that's what you're going to need. Now, I have friends who don't have landlines in their homes anymore because they felt it was a cost saving. Well, if you do have a landline, don't drop it for a cell phone line. If you don't have a landline, trust me, there's going to be a time that you might have to use somebody else's landline. And I don't know how that's going to work <laughs> if you're not allowed to go into someone else's house, but it has to do with stability. You may need extra chargers. Like I last night, I said to my husband, oh, I think the, the charger for my laptop is going a little goofy. I need to buy another one. And we have junk drawers filled with electronics and sure enough by the time I woke up the next morning my husband had all neatly wrapped for me a new charger meaning one that was five years old that still worked on one of the machines. Um, I like cork boards and index cards for keeping track of projects not just what's online and paper and file folders. So it may be that the way you do things that you're going to find that even though it's supposed to be a paperless class, you're still going to have hard documents that you have to keep track of, contracts and things like that, that you really should be printing out and keeping a copy for. And um, when a client sends me a contract, and I work with high tech companies, but mostly libraries and universities, so on, I make hard copies of everything, not because I am ignoring the concerns about the environment, but too many times people have lost stuff. I hate to mention any government agencies. I'll only use the initials, but the IRS two months ago lost a whole year's worth of returns and information. And when my um, superbly competent uh, accountant called them to check up on something, and they said, well, we never got that. And she got a little ticked off at them and sent them all the stuff. We had to redo and send everything. Fortunately, the accounting firm, even though they file electronically, kept all the paper copies and we had all the printouts to be able to get to them. So that's again under the definition, all technology sucks. Um, also, there's a time when you may have to rescue something that's lost, like with the IRS thing. If you're looking at something on a screen and you need to review it, maybe you should do a screenshot to be able to capture what's on and either have it on your computer or yes, print it out so you can refer to it later that during the blackout and unfortunately places like Colorado and Nebraska, we have um, tornadoes and thunderstorms and lightning and all that good stuff with our ginormous storms from the Midwest. And there's times when your computer might not work. You can't have it. Make hard copies. Record what you can about what you're doing. Don't just rely on what's on their other server. And maybe it means backing up on other devices. If you have other people's cell phones or iPads or whatever you have that you have a way to assume something's going to go wrong, to assume that you're going to need something vital for your class and you're not going to be able to get to the learning platform or whatever else you need, um, will you have those backups? It's insurance, folks. It takes a few more minutes to do this every day. You're going to feel so smug when something happens and you're prepared. It's worth it just for feeling smug, right? Um, 
you also have to be looking at um, software about the changes that happen. Uh, I have had the experience of running classes that were national web webinars with national training organizations where we tested tested everything and then we got complacent and we were doing a weekly class and we didn't do a tech check before the class and sure enough that's when the company updated the software so it was no longer uh, compatible with my laptop and we had to totally change what we were doing but we were prepared and so what i tell people is before an important deadline uh, particularly if despite what I'm saying, you're still a procrastinator, you aren't keeping up with what's going on um, in the world. And you think, well, the computer worked two weeks ago, the learning management uh, platform, this LMS system, it worked just fine, it'll work today. Uh, uh, uh. You test and you test. And I would say 80% of the training organizations I work with around the country, some of whom I have worked with many years, some of whom I have monthly contracts with, you know what? We test the technology, even if it's just for five minutes before every program, usually a day or two before, so we have time to fix things. Um, and even then things can go wrong. Um, the audio is something that's touchy on a lot of systems. What we've noticed, and this is not hard science, if something is going to mess up, it's probably going to be the audio more than the visual, meaning that if you're in a situation with a, a live program where you're trying to interact with people, uh, things like Zoom and go to webinar and many of the online uh, programs where you share video, audio goes first. Audio is what's going to mess up first. And again, the sound of your voice and everything, having something good works well. For me, and this was advice I got from a friend of mine who is a professional in radio, a quality gaming headset, the kind that has the built-in microphone and the earphones, um, is, is the best way, unless you have a fancy recording studio, to ensure that you're going to hear and be able to be heard the best by other people. I have hearing loss. But my hearing loss really isn't so much of a problem when I've got this great headset on. Also, I have the one that have the baffling around the the um, muff sort of on the on where I'm listening, and it cuts out a lot of ambient noise, so I can really focus on what's going on. So talk to friends who are really into gaming. Uh, we use Sennheiser. I don't get money for mentioning their name, but there's others as well. And usually you can find bargains online. The backup, okay, the cloud is someone else's hardware. The cloud is someone else's uh, machine somewhere probably in Southern Florida and they've just had a hurricane. And yes, I have had um, uh, Google Docs fail. I have had all kinds of online services fail. I've had Dropbox fail. So we do, in addition to other kinds of backups, we do physical backups, daily at least. And if someone is working on a very important document, um, regardless of what they have to store things in the cloud, that's when they might take a look at getting um, a backup external drive to be hooked in so that they're constantly saving things. We use two or three different ways to back up stuff in our business. And we have never had a loss of data except when someone has talked me into putting things on Google Docs or in Dropbox. Um, and it's particularly important if you're working with irreplaceable documents, things you have just struggled with over the years. You want to have some way of not just counting on the mythical cloud. It's a myth. I'm sorry, <laughs> that it's anything but sending something to someone else's uh, server or hardware. Um, this is now, everybody knows this, and I mess up on this about once every two weeks. And so don't, don't be pat, do better than me. If you have something where you have to write a lot, the um, easy way to do it is to write directly into the computer on the platform, edit it as you go, and then you post and that's when you find out that you either lost the document lost everything you did posted a lot of stuff that was quick and fast and made you look incompetent and illiterate so what we want to do is to get into the habit of writing the responses on your computer first or even longhand if that's your preference edit them then and then back them up before you post 
It, it just, I'm on a national, international writing group online, and at least once a week, somebody says, I made the mistake of writing directly into the thing, and I lost everything I did. They even tell you, don't do that, don't do that, right? Have the document aside and put it there. And I have to say, in five years in being in this group, I have not lost a word, but I've known a lot of people who've lost a lot of stuff by not doing that, practicing that. Uh, but you don't have to listen to me. I think the first 10 times that you lose important documents, you'll, you'll figure it out for most of the time. So what are these things we call better practices? What seems to work most of the time in most situations online? Um, first of all, it's the idea of participation. We live in an age, and this is where I'm putting on my old people, you kids get off my lawn hat, where learning is very passive. And I went to 12 years of public school and K through 12 was very much for the most part sitting in a classroom, having someone talk to you and then you do stuff. Well, that's not too bad because you have the interaction with a live human being, but then it was like PowerPoints and videos and stuff. And I'm someone who teaches with a flip chart and I might draw or write, my handwriting's terrible, but people are shocked like, well, where's the PowerPoint? I thought I could just like nap for 45 minutes watching slides in the dark or watching a movie or something. Uh-uh, no. And what will happen then is people will carry that passive way of, I mean, I'm not gonna even call it learning, that passive way of attending a of, of real class and move it on to an online class. And what they don't realize uh, particularly if you're doing this for a grade or that you really want to learn something, the active participation you show for all of that writing we talked about before is probably going to determine your grade. It's going to determine how will you do in that class. Also, how other people see you. So I tell people that even though personally I'm not so good at reading all the fine print in a contract, the syllabus or the instructions you have about what's going to happen in the class and the course and the expectations, read the fine print. Read it and read it and read it because you're going to find that there's a very, there's a high likelihood that in the rubric, which is that little chart they put up, if you do this, this is the grades you get. If you do this, this is the grades you get. It's going to say things like, if you don't post more than five times per a week or a session, um, this is the grade you're going to get as opposed to if you post more. So yes, active participation probably, if you're doing this for a grade, is going to impact your grade. Also, that partnership is very important. And what I liked to do with my online courses is to encourage people to find someone else in the class uh, that they could email or uh, develop a relationship with or whatever, maybe because they had a similar background, they were taking the class for a similar reason. I had an interesting situation where I had a woman in California and a woman in New Jersey taking the same class. They were both recent immigrants to the United States and uh, one of them was from an Asian country, the other one was from, as I recall, call France. And they were having trouble with their online courses because they were learning English at the same time. I paired them up and they helped each other um, and weren't embarrassed to ask each other for help. I also, by the way, made a very stern private message to everyone not to demean people based on what their writing skills were because they were learning a new language as they were participating in the class. And I asked the people in the class to be supportive. And they were wonderful. Oh, they were so wonderful. And in the reviews of the class, um, the two women said over and over again, everyone was so nice. And you could see their writing improve as the semester went in. So partnering with people either within the class or outside the class can make a difference for certainly. Um, this issue, too, of participation, this goes back to expediency. So we were presenting these classes, these learning classes that people in a number of states were taking for credit, um, the CE credit as a requirement for their jobs. And since most of my clients are library people and university people, I had people who said, I'm taking this class because it's required by my employer. I need X amount of 
CE credits, continuing education credits per year to maintain my um, credentials and so on. So my boss in this project at the University of North Texas got a call from someone at a university in Ohio. And they said, we're kind of confused. They said, we have a um, person on our faculty who just submitted the paperwork for 23 of your classes. We had like 30 of them up at the time. And my boss said, he said, oh, wow, that's terrific. She, she took 23 of them. She said, yes. And she said she finished them all yesterday. Is that possible? Well, my boss cracked up and he said it would be possible if all she did was look at the screen and go click, 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 and basically did the absolutely minimum amount and just sort of whizzed through everything at top speed. Yes, the um, computer keeps track. And if the computer program says you finished it, you would get your certificate as proof. What she doesn't know, he told the person from Ohio, is that our platform also keeps track of how long it takes someone to do the program. So he checked and sure enough, she was taking classes that usually take, oh, six weeks to get through. And she was clicking through in seven minutes. Um, and the Ohio person said, thank you so much. We're going to have a very interesting conversation. So we laughed and laughed about it. And we decided that one of the things for the credit classes we needed to put in the materials is, oh, by the way, we should let you know that your progress through the classes is something recorded. So we know how long it took and everything, simply because we didn't want this to happen to someone else. So again, expediency, um, actually do the work. <laughs> um, a courtesy is that will make you look better to other people and actually will help everyone. Instead of just plunging in to state your own opinion on an online discussion, um, respond to other people first. So let's say, for example, that I'm in a class about the history of the Civil War, making that up. And people are typing in a whole bunch of opinions about something that happened, uh, something that Lincoln did during the Civil War. And I have my opinion, and I think I'm right and other people are wrong. And I just plunge in. Well, that's one way to do it. Another way is to say, oh, um, Sam, that's an interesting point you made. Where did you get that information? Um, you know, how did you form that opinion? Or, yeah, Gail. I want to second what Gail said. Gail, I think you made a really important point about that. If you get in the habit of doing that, you're going to be like a star in the class. You are going to basically ride to the top of other people's esteem. But you know what you're also doing? You're also helping other people in the class. You're making it a better experience for everybody. And that's kind of what our job is in life, is to make things a little better for everybody else. Keep up, as we said before. Asynchronous obviously means you can take the class at any time. You don't have to all be online at the same time. But again, as I said before, it's very easy to fall behind if you think, well, I can take this at 3 o'clock in the morning. I can do this at 7 o'clock on a Saturday. Um, that's true. And I have to say that's part of the fun of the 21st century is the 24-7 thing. All of the programs that we do uh, for pattern research and working with other uh, training partners like DoSpace, everything's recorded. And there's interesting statistics that are a little flaky about the increase year by year by people preferring recorded over live. Sometimes it swings both ways. I just did a program for a group of Wisconsin library system, uh, systems a couple of days ago, and we had 400 people sign up, but 340 showed up for the program. Usually the averages are about 50-50. I think more people are starting to like the live stuff Again, because it gives them a chance to ask questions. So remember, in time management, the asynchronous classes can fool you, feeling like, oh, I've got all this time to plan. Um, be careful. Be careful, OK? Um, make that interactive um, relationship you have with the instructors um, something new, because you can't take for granted that they're experienced. 
Remember, we have a huge number of people who are kind of being thrown off the cliff into the water in hopes they will swim. And I get emails from people all the time who are experienced instructors, either they are experienced in workplace instruction face to face or in high school and college, and they have never taught online before and they're struggling <clears throat> too. So it's really good if you have what you might call a peer-based attitude that you see people who are in a class with you as you're all equals, but that's not always the truth. So make a little extra effort to connect with them because they may be just as concerned as you are about things. And that means following through. Don't just send stuff off to people. It's like our um, experience with the IRS, the account nagged and nagged and nagged and finally got them to admit they had never gotten the documents or you know we think they did and lost it but we won't say that or our wonderful accountant a different accountant who's the lawyer for this program we're doing where radio silence for a month and we just kept being persistent and persistent and persistent until finally he went oops so just don't send soft stuff off in the stratosphere have a way of confirming that your instructor actually received the documents you were talking about the writing. Um, two things you can do to edit your stuff when you're alone is to edit it out loud, meaning you read out loud things that you've worked on. And if you're editing, start at the last sentence or the last paragraph and work your way forward because that's a trick that will help fool your brain so you're more likely to see mistakes that otherwise you might overlook as well. So here's some ideas of first steps that you might take. And then I'm gonna be turning things over to Bree to see if we had any questions or comments from the audience. What's your tech plan? What's the plan B if you have a problem? To be honest about the scheduling and is there something that you're doing that you need to stop doing during this period so you have more time for your online classroom? So um, thanks for coming today and let me check back in with Bree and see if we had any questions or comments. Okay, here we go. Any suggestions to help carve time with kids? With I think it's sort of with kids you engage them is my experience is that you engage them in the learning. Um, now this is going to sound a little off the wall, but my dad was a doctor and we moved to a new town and I was 13 years old um, and my dad had to be board certified in clinical pathology to keep his new job at the hospital. So he was studying at home all the time. And what, and I was a kid and I wanted attention from my father. So what my dad did is the same thing that my sister did. He got me involved and he'd say, okay, I'm gonna write down three things. You read these things out loud to me. When my mother was starting, uh, went back to school at the age of 57 and was studying English literature, she would get me involved in taking a look at her papers and so on. Even with little kids, we tell people this is the new job and will you help? And again, it's the kind of family that I was brought up in, but my uh, parents, when it came to learning, would treat us like adults and they would talk to us about uh, adult subjects, not meaning like scary adult subjects, but things like you know math or science. We'd learn together and it made, um, I think, a big deal. So I'm a big fan of the intergenerational part. We also, though, have to be reasonable about saying to people the practice of, I'm working on something now, and it may be that if you have a lot of kids that you might have to uh, block out your structure in 15 minute or 30 minute blocks, not like a two hour block at a time. But just yelling at the kid to leave you alone usually doesn't work. And yes, we might have to lock the dog in the kitchen, who knows about stuff. But engaging them, I think is a wonderful way to share your learning and have them watch a screen with you and have comments about things like that. Every webinar that I do, every all the learning I do, um, is family safe. <laughs> There's nothing that I teach that someone can't sit down with their 10 year old and watch it with appreciation. So that that's my advice based on my experience. Hi, Pat. I'm Kim. I'm another do space uh, moderator that's in here. Um, it does look like we did have another question about the PowerPoint. Um, would they be it looks like um, somebody is wanting to get a copy of your PowerPoint. Um, is that possible? And if yes, how would they go about doing that? Well, as I understood, I gave Bree a um, set of the slides and a PDF of the slides to hold the um, 
um, information and that you folks oh. have that so yes. they could contact you. Yes. It does, looks like she just posted that in the chat. Yeah. So great. Sorry, right, I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing that 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 these systems will mute people's like spontaneously and you don't know it until 10 minutes later that someone is like smashing into your door knocking on your door and telling you you're you're muted. My husband kind of oversees all my stuff sort of as a production engineer behind the scenes and he's had to come up and open the door to my office and say you're muted. <laughs> so yeah, we all have to watch out for each other. And um yeah, so the, the slides, if you don't have the particular type font on your computer, which in this case is something called Open Sans, S-A-N-S, uh, the PDF works well and it'll work on any computer and you're welcome to share. You, you know, there's, I don't copyright my own material. It's up to do space how they handle that. Yeah, you're more than welcome to share these. Terrific. Looks like we've answered everything. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, and we do have more webinars um, available. If you go to dospaceorg.org and then go to our calendar, um, we have more webinars listed and we'll have more webinars uh, throughout um, the end of April and into May. Thank you very much, Pat, for coming and speaking with us today. My pleasure. You guys have a good day.